Hi, I'm Grant from Blackmagic Design. We've got some really exciting products to show you today. We even have a whole new camera, so there's going to be some really interesting things to talk about. Uh, but first, I'd like to start with A2 Mini. You know, the A2 Mini customers are doing some really amazing work, actually some very creative work. You know, um, A2 Mini just has so many different uses and it's because it's so powerful. Uh, but it's often used on location and the internet connectivity is really tough on your mobile because you've got to find someone to plug the Ethernet into and that's often not possible. So we've been really working hard on this problem and what we've got is a new software update that lets you tether your mobile phone to the A2 Mini. Now it supports all the ATEM Mini Pro models and that's because they're the ones that actually do the live streaming. It supports both Android and Apple phones. You pretty much just plug the phone into the USB connection on the ATEM Mini and it works. The ATEM Mini Pro will automatically recognize the phone when it's plugged in. There's no settings, you just plug in the phone and it works. So let me show you how this works. Now the ATEM Mini Pro here is set up to live stream to YouTube and on the rear monitor I've got the uh, web browser with the YouTube display in it so it's live streaming through. Um, now the ATEM Mini Pro here is connected to the internet via its Ethernet connection. Uh, one thing that's really important also to know about one before we do this is you have to activate the tethering on your phone to actually make this work. So I've got a phone here, um, it's got the tethering enabled, uh, which is the phone here, and I've got a USB cable, so I'll plug the, the phone in. There it is there. And I'll plug in the other end into the uh, USB port on the back of the ATEM Mini. So what'll happen is, I don't know if you can get an overhead shot of that, um, but the, ah, oh, there it is, the little tethering icons come up. It's a bit different, I've got an older phone, so this phone's a newer one, so it's got a slightly different indicator. Now, the A10 Mini can see the phone, and if you look on the multi-view, you can see there's a little uh, phone icons appeared on the streaming uh, status view. So, what we need now is we'll unplug the Ethernet and see how it switches across. So if I unplug the Ethernet, you'll see the icon on the multi-view is actually grey. So I've unplugged the, uh, US, uh, the Ethernet here, and what you'll see is it'll switch across. Now, you can see the icon's gone red and it's flashed the on-air indicator and that shows that it's now switched over and it's live streaming. And you see there's a little bit of an interruption to the live stream, but it's done a clean switch over and now it's running with the phone data and not the Ethernet because, you know, the Ethernet's not even plugged in. So let's switch back. So we'll plug the Ethernet back in and we'll unplug the phone. And you'll see that, uh, I'll straighten myself up here a little bit. Um, so the overhead camera looks great. And you'll see now it'll switch back. The uh, phone icon's disappeared from, the, uh, from the, the streaming status indicator and it's gone back and it's switched across and now we're streaming back on the Ethernet. It also does something that computers don't do very well and you just saw it. Basically, that's changing between mobile data and Ethernet. The ATEM Mini Pro will keep streaming when the network changes. You can switch it backwards and forwards. So if you have an Ethernet problem, you can plug your phone in. But a lot of times software applications actually need to quit, be quit and relaunched because they'll actually connect through one of the services and they don't really you know, switch across. But ATEM Mini doesn't need to do that, it'll just switch live, even while you're streaming, and you just saw how it did that. Because um, you know, we've got full control, it runs Blackmagic OS, so we've got full control over the whole process of how we connect. Um, so, and another thing I think it's really also important uh, to think about with this phone tethering stuff is the mobile data speed. You know, phones can vary a lot in data rate. I mean, every internet connection can do that. Uh, also, the data rate will go up with frame rate. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider. Also, 5G phones are faster than 4G phones. So if there's not enough um, speed to, to do the live stream through your phone, there are some options. You can switch to a lower quality. Uh, you can also switch to a lower frame rate. And so lower frame rates are okay, of course, because the, all the inputs will just convert. So even if you're running 1080p60 and you wanted to, say, stream at 24p because the data rate is too much at 60p, you can switch the switcher over to 24p. All the inputs will just convert and it'll just work. So it's really good. So I think this mobile data will be really helpful to people. Uh, it's actually in a new software update. It's called ATEM Update 8.6, and it'll be available on our website today. We'll post that. It supports uh, mobile data on ATEM Mini Pro and the ATEM Mini Pro ISO models, because they're the ones that have got the streaming built in. And also, it'll be available free of charge, so you'll just be able to download the update and add that feature. Okay, so now I wanted to discuss the ATEM Mini family as a whole. You know, the ATEM Mini's been really well received. It's got a lot of professional features, and these are not dumbed down switches, but they're true professional switches, you know, for important work, even though they are HDMI. Um, you know, people have used the switches in a lot of ways we never expected, uh, which has been quite a lot of fun to see. I mean, uh, some remarkable ways. It's uh, quite shocking. Um, so we thought, really, how far could we push this design? Um, you know, we wanted to try and we were sort of thinking, could we build a really much more powerful model? But how far could we take it? Like, really, how far could we push this? You know, could we build a high-end switcher, but kind of in an ATEM Mini design? 
And we weren't really sure if it was possible. Um, you know, we've been working on this for a while, uh, but it was a challenge we kind of set ourselves. Um, you know, there's a bunch of challenges. Could we make it affordable enough? You know, could we keep the advanced electronics cool without fan noise, which is really important because often these switches are used in the same environment with the cameras. So you don't want the, you know, the fan noise being picked up. Uh, was it even really possible to fit a big switcher into an 18 mini design? So, well, not fit exactly. It has grown a little bit in size, but um, we've been able to do it. We've pulled it off and the new model is called 18 mini extreme. It's dramatically more powerful. Um, I'll bring one out and show you. Uh, I've got one here, so here it is. <laughs> it's quite big, as you can see, it's a uh, much bigger switcher. You can see the size difference there. Um, I'll try and straighten it up a bit. So. so you can see it's got a much bigger control panel, a lot more controls. It's a, you know, it's a monster, this thing. Um, so if you're looking for a more powerful to mini then this is it. Um, we've really gone for it. So actually, I'll, I'll start by showing you the back. Um, let me uh, just put that aside. I'll move the phone out of the way. Let's have a look at the rear view. I don't know if you can get a close up of that there. Um, so there are a lot more connections on the back. So you can see that it's got the 12 volt DC input. Uh, now it includes a bigger power supply because it's, you know, obviously uses more power. There's gigabit ethernet built in. You know, we're gonna be able to use that for a few things in the future as well. So it's got tons of fast uh, ethernet. It's got the string built in. So it's a bit like the AT Mini Pro models, a bigger version of AT Mini Pros in some ways. Uh, so you don't need any external streaming software because that's built in. You know, it supports YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, Vimeo, and more, like just like the Atomini Pro models do. But it now has two USB connections. So this is important if you want to, like, maybe you want to use a webcam while you're recording to a USB disk at the same time. Or say if you want to do uh, recording while you're live streaming via the phone because it supports a lot, you know, the phone tethering as well as the Atomini Pro now does. Um, of course, you can still connect a USB hub, see if you want more devices, but I think it's really nice having two USB connections built in it's much simpler. Now it's a HD switcher, so all the HDMI connections support up to 1080p60, and it has two independent HDMI outputs. Now these work like aux outputs, so you can route different video sources to them. And this model has eight inputs as well, obviously it's twice the number of inputs. So more inputs means you can use more cameras, and that's really nice if you're using like, if you can't afford camera operators and you wanna just use more camera angles, so you can just add more cameras. Um, now each input has a separate standards converter, so you could have eight different video standards plugged in. You just plug everything in and it works. The microphones are the same, the same microphones work. There's now an additional headphone output and the headphones are proper monitoring output so it's on a separate uh, audio monitoring bus. So let's check out the front again. In fact, what we'll do is we'll plug it in, which is a bit of an ordeal with so many connections. Now I've got eight hyperdecks that we're using as sources here. So let me just plug in, I'll actually sit it on top and start plugging away. Let's plug in some power and I'll plug in the network and I'll plug my video output. And I'll go through the inputs because there's quite a lot of inputs here. So sorry, it takes a moment because there's so much to plug in. It's the problem with the bigger switcher that's got so many connections. I'll get rid of my ATEM Mini Pro, move it out of the way. Actually, I'll position it so you can see on the overhead camera because we've got a camera overhead here. Now I've got a whole bunch of extra inputs because of uh, the number of sources. I've got an extra output, which we'll plug in because it's got the two video outs. And I've got four more inputs. So I've got quite a lot of cables. And so these are all Hyperdex playing back these different camera angles of a cooking show. But camera one is actually a, a pocket camera just over there. So there we go. So I've got everything plugged in. Looks good. And we've got all nice and straight so that overhead camera looks pretty good. So one of the first things you can see now I've plugged in the multi-view. Uh, I've plugged well both video outputs and all the inputs. You can see the multi-view is a little different so I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, let's have a look around the front panel and see what's on there. So we've got it now running with all eight inputs connected, so I can just switch between all those sources. So you see there it is. Um, and also there's the smaller source buttons over here, so you've got like two media players and a few more things there. Um, you can still change between cut and auto, so you can still do the transitions, uh, just like you can with the ATEM Mini. Of course, auto is the sort of industry standard way of selecting a transition versus a cut. Any ATEM customer would already know that. Um, now it's got the same uh, transition duration buttons, so it's half a second to two seconds, and they're located just over here, so you can change the durations of the transitions. And they've also got a fade to black control here, so it still has that. So you know, it looks very similar to an 18 Mini. Now the transition selection is located above the auto button over here, and we've got more of those. So you can set to different uh, things, so like for example, at the moment it's set to mix. So when you do a transition, it'll be a mix. Uh, but you can also do other transitions like uh, dip, for example. 
There it is, you know, and you've got um, like six wipes on there. There's more uh, buttons for different uh, transitions. So you've got you know, six wipes and including horizontal, vertical, diagonal, circle and square wipes. There's also DVE transitions. So if you can select some of those DVE transitions and do those, so you can see that there they are there. Um, and the DVE transitions on the buttons directly include push right, squeeze right, push down, squeeze down. Um, and you know, I'll switch back to mix and in fact, I'll switch back to cut. So you can see that you know, you've know you got a, a few more transitions over there. There's also upgraded video output controls because we've got more sources now. So the HDMI video outputs are actually like aux outputs. So you can route video to them. So output, HDMI 1 has uh, uh, settings on the control panel here. And so you can, see, you can see the location of where they are there. Um, now you can uh, route sources out using the uh, ATEM software control where you get access to both video outs and you can use them both like OXs. But you can view it on the front panel here. So let's have a quick look. So, you know, I'm looking at, uh, in fact, if I can switch the uh, video across, I can see this. Um, so that's the second video output I've got on the back there. So I can now switch the sources um, between the camera inputs to that video output live. And you notice that you know, it's, it's basically a clean feed of the video sources and it's very, you know, the switching's very clean. Now you can connect this to a video projector and one of those inputs could be a slideshow and you can you know, switch to the video projector from the front here. So it's almost like doing a separate live switch. Um, and also video hub control panels uh, work. So that's nice. Now you've also got um, a multi-view output, but we'll set it back to program because we're actually using a two monitor display. So you can see you've got a lot of really nice controls there. Now it's got the same streaming controls on the top right of the panel there, the same on and off air controls uh, there. Uh, you've also got the same record and stop controls. Um, there's also some extra key controls, which we've got over here. Uh, you have the key one and downstream key uh, controls on there now, and it's nice to have a downstream key button. So if you're using a logo on the downstream key, you've got that. Now again, all the keys are all available in the ATEM software control, so that's nice. Now the other thing we've got on the front panel is a bunch of macro buttons. Um, all ATEM Mini models have macros, but the ATEM Mini Extreme has six macro buttons on the front panel that you can fire them by pushing one of those buttons. And there they are there. It makes them much more accessible. Um, you can set up really complex effects and just trigger them just on one of those, those buttons there. I can just get a close up of that. Uh, now the DVEs, um, the ATEM Mini Extreme has two DVEs. So you can do like a two up views for in interviewing people. There's front panel buttons uh, with some presets for you. Um, so you can select some of the DVE buttons and I've got, uh, I can select the DVE on there. You can see I've got, that's the two up. I've got the uh, different views there. I can select a few of the different ones. Um, see there on the bottom there's a two up view and you can see I've got two there. Uh, so that's pretty nice. And you also again get full control of the DVEs from the ATEM software control. But these preset buttons make working with DVEs really fast. So I've, you know, I'll leave that, I think that's off here, yeah, that's off. Now the other thing we've got is a select bus. Powerful switches have uh, what they call a select bus on the control panel. Now what it does, it allows you to control the sources into internal processing such as DVEs. So let me show you how this works. So say for example, something like the dip transition, which I'll, I'll select over there. Now, we were using a color generator. When we did this before, there's a, trans there's a source for that dip and we were using a color generator, that's why it was white. So when we did a, a dip, it went to, whoops, I've got to select order. So when I do a transition, you can see it was white. Um, because it was using a color generator and that color generator is, is white. Um, but what it allows us to do is we can change uh, the source that we're gonna use for that. Now the sources are along the top here, so you can see that, and the destinations are along the bottom. So any under destinations include inputs to keys, DVEs, uh, the DV video sources, the dip source, and, and a lot more. So the dip is along the bottom here, so let's have a look. There it is there. So that's the dip source. So we select that on the bottom row, and then you can see that it's showing the color generator on the top row. And I think we probably picked that up on the top camera. And so you can see that. So we could change it to something else. So for example, if we change it to bars, now when I do a transition, whoops, I changed it to black. There's bars. Um, so there you go. So now I changed the dip source to bars. So you can really see how fast it is to change sources on the front panel itself. Uh, so let's change something else. Let's change one of the DVEs. So I'll turn the two up view back on. Um, so let's uh, turn the DVE back on. So you can see I've got the two up view with the DVEs. And now you can see I've got those two DVEs. So let's change the inputs to those DVEs. So the DVE sources are actually over here. Whoops, there they are, DVE1. So now what's really interesting is I've selected DVE1 on the lower row and you can notice that the top row is now showing that that's uh, the input, one of the camera inputs is going to that DVE. Now what's really interesting is that the they went red. What this means is that the DVE is on air and it's a warning to show you that anything you change here will be seen by the viewers. So if I turn the, um, the DVE on and off, 
then you can see the color changes back to white. So you can see it's it's like a tally on the select bus and let you know that if you change anything, you know, people are gonna notice it. So I think that's really nice to have that. So let's again, let's select color bars. So you can see I've got uh, some color bars. I can select some different cameras. The camera numbers are over here, so I can go through different camera sources and select those into the DVE. So you can see I've got, you know, I can, when I change the input, the DVE input changes. So the select bus makes you know, this stuff much faster because you can really route all the sources. It's the same workflow as you see on really big switches, but now we have it here right on the front panel. It's really fast and it's really simple to use. So I'll just turn my DVEs back off again. Now the other thing we've got in ATEM Mini Extreme is camera control right on the front panel. The buttons are located just above the inputs, um, so it allows really quick camera adjustments. So if I cut to camera one, we have a pocket cinema camera 6K connected to input number one. So I can cut to input number one. Uh, which is just here. Now this camera has studio features including lens control, tally and a color corrector. So we can control that from the switcher. So if I go between camera one, if you can get a close up of the uh, screen on the back, you can see as I'm switching to the camera and back again, I've got the tally light coming on and off on the LCD on the back. Now iris is the default control. So you'll notice here we've got up and down arrows. So if I start adjusting those, you can see I'm now adjusting the iris. And that's the most common control you need, which is iris. Cause you know, if you're using outside, you know, you're doing outdoor shooting, the lighting conditions can change, so you can track those lighting conditions. So you can see there I'm changing the iris. But there's also other camera settings you can control as well. So you just need to select the override buttons. And those four buttons above here, if you can see that, you can see them on the overhead camera, there's the, the all the arrows here for the, um, the iris. But these four buttons will override those up and down buttons. And you can say, for example, we can press gain, or um, well, that's black, and then we can adjust um, that setting. Oops. There it is there, you gotta be fairly quick. So now there's buttons for overriding the uh, levels for shutter speed, black level and focus. The focus one's actually quite interesting um, because if you, uh, let's, I'll show you basically how this works. If we just focus and really make the camera go out of focus. There it is there. So I've adjusted that camera way out of focus. Now what you can do is you can press and hold the focus button to trigger the autofocus in the camera. So if I just press and hold that button, you'll see now it'll trigger the autofocus in the camera. So it's a really great way of really fast using the camera's features itself to do the focus. Uh, now the camera control is really simple, but it's surprisingly powerful. You have full camera control obviously in the ATEM software control, but it's, there's, it's quite useful to have all this on the front panel. And of course you can also use one of the ATEM camera control panels you know, if you really want to go for it. Uh, now the audio controls is another set of features on the front panel. They're very similar to the uh, other ATEM Mini models. They're located above the inputs along here. Um, with more inputs, we still have the full audio processing on all the inputs. So each input has audio processing uh, for like, it has a compressor, six band parametric EQ, limiter, expander, and more. That's on all the inputs. Um, and there's also now, what's been added is headphone controls for the, for, the, uh, for the headphone output, and they've been added on the panel here. So you've got level up and down, you can set the levels up and down. You've also got a mute and a reset as well. So that's nice for headphone control right, there, right from there. Now, even though that's the front panel, we haven't really described what's inside yet. Up until now, we've really only talked about the front panel controls, but the really big increase in power in this, in this switcher is the internally. So what I'll do is I'll change over to the ATEM Mini software control and we can check this out. So, well, the first thing we can actually talk about is the new multi-view. So what I need to do is plug in, I'll plug in using USB into the, into the software because we haven't got a connection up here. Um, so let's plug in my USB and we'll plug in one of the, into one of the two USB ports that we've got on the back. So now we should have the um, ATEM software control come up. There it is. And uh, so you can see the, um, the multi-view is a little different to the ATEM Mini Pro. Um, I don't know if we can cut to that. We've actually taken the multi-view from the ATEM Constellation 8K. It's our best multi-view by far. Um, it's an incredible multi-view. So this is why we wanted to really bring that across. So we've taken it from our top switcher. It still includes the audio meters on all the views. It still includes custom labels on the views, which the other mini, ATEM Minis can do. Uh, the ATEM Mini Pro, sorry, the ATEM Mini Pros are the ones that have the multi-view. Uh, but now you can also select the number of views. It supports up to 16 views in total. So let me show you how this works. So over in the ATEM software control, all we have to do is go to the settings and select multi-view. And you can see here's our multi-view settings over here. So if I wanna to change to 16 views, for example, I just have to click on this little icon here and it'll now change to 16 views. So I can also change sources. So for example, I could change uh, well, actually, that's already on the audio status. So, or I could change it to, you know, anything I really like, one of the color generators. Well, I've already got a color generator number one there. I could do it on color generator two. 
So you can see it's it's quite nice, and I'll you know switch it back to my program view, which I have there. Um, now, 16 views is really great with those two HDMI video outputs uh, because you can use a two monitor setup, which is what we actually are showing you behind. Um, I'll go back to a nice uh, shot. Uh, so one monitor has the 16 sources on the multi view, and the other one has the program view. So that's a really nice combination to have because you can use those two outputs to really give you that big program view, and then you've got tons of views on the multi view. Now, the AT Mini Pro also has a media player with 20 still frames. Um, with the latest software update that we did on the AT Mini Pros, they even retain those still frames between a power cycle. But with the AT Mini Extreme, you now get two media players. So let's take a look at that. So if we switch to the media play uh, page, I'll get rid of this uh, there. And if I go to the media page, you can see I've got the two media players. And we can load a still into media player number one. So I've just loaded a still into there. And I can load a, uh, another graphic into media player number two. In fact, the default media players have already set up to use slots one and two. So now you have two video sources into the switcher and you can see them on the multi-view. In fact, the uh, multi-view by default shows the two media players there. Now, previously we showed you using DV preset buttons to turn on the two multi-views. We've got, uh, sorry, DVEs. We've got two DVEs in the switcher. This is great for interviewing multiple people. You can uh, show um, uh, like two different interviewers at the same time. So that's really nice. So let me show you the DVEs in the switcher. So if I go across to the palettes, I can see I've got my upstream keys and there's the DVE. And you can see I can turn on that keyer. So there it is there. And I can move the DVEs around. You know, this is where you do the adjustments. Um, whoops, I've got to click it there. And you can see you can position those all over the place. And it's really uh, changed the size. And um, So you know, two DVEs are really nice. So I'll, I'll turn off that key. So there's two key, uh, DVEs built in. And that's just really flexible. But with so many inputs, we also thought we could do a lot more. Uh, you know, more inputs actually allow us to do some pretty exciting things. So we've actually included SuperSource in the A10 Mini Extreme. Now what SuperSource is, if you don't know because you haven't used some of our bigger switcher, super, bigger switches, SuperSource is a four, it's four DVEs in a multi-layer compositing engine. So what this means is you actually get four video sources as separate DVEs in a layer stack. So you basically get a four DV kind of layering engine um, Plus you've got the two DVEs that are actually built in there. So that's six DVEs in total in the switcher. Uh, there's also, um, the SuperSource has uh, support for a background graphic as well as a foreground graphic. Now a background graphic goes behind all those DVEs, whereas a foreground graphic goes over the front of the DVEs. And that's actually really very powerful because it allows you to create like really nice graphics with borders and things because it goes in front of the DVEs, then it really creates nice borders on those DVEs. So it's really nice. And so SuperSource is fantastic for interviews where each interviewer has a separate picture in picture. You know, it's great for gaming com uh, competitions. You could have four cameras and four consoles all connected at once because you've got enough inputs and you could have, you know, combinations of, you know, of gamers and, and, and their console, you know, consoles or uh, overlaid on top. It's, it's really nice. So let's have a quick look and we'll show you how this works. Uh, so what we do is we'll start by selecting SuperSource in the front panel. We have a dedicated button on the front panel for SuperSource. There it is there. And now it's basically by default it's a four box setup as you can see there. Now this is the super source, it's not even the normal DVEs. But you can also change it in the ATEM software control. So what you do is you go into the super source palette, which there it is there. And you can see I've got a bunch of different interesting combinations you can select. Um, and you can show the arrangement positions and you can set all the inputs to the super source DVEs. So you can see, um, see there, you can change the different boxes and then do the controls and change the inputs and all the settings and where they are. And you can also load in a graphic. So for example, if I go to the media player and load in, a, load in a foreground graphic, I can now change that into media player two and I can go back to super source and I select art. Now what I need to do is I need to select media player two as my graphic source, but it's, the, it's made that graphic the background. I actually want the graphic to be the foreground. So let's do that because it's got borders on it and the borders actually now become the DV borders. So you can see there it's all lined up and it looks really nice. Now, you know, you can spend a lot of time getting all this perfect. We've actually got the graphic. This graphic just supports the default uh, super, uh, super source layout. Um, but really the trick here is to line up all the DVs so they match the graphic. And, you know, we made this graphic to suit the default super source layout so we didn't have to spend time doing it here. But you can really see how powerful that is. Our super source is really separate to those two main DVEs. So that means they're still available uh, if you need to use them for something else. Although I'm not sure how much stuff you can really put on the screen at one time. Now, the other thing we've done with A2 Mini Extreme is we have eight inputs. Um, so we can do a lot more with the keyers. 
So what eight inputs mean is that eight too many extreme is big enough to actually do virtual sets. So we now have four ATEM advanced chroma keys in this switcher, which means you can do four separate chroma keys at the same time. They're all completely independent. So that basically means you could have four separate cameras that could have a dedicated chroma key each. So you can use basically the eight inputs to do virtual set, uh, to create virtual sets, four live cameras over four live backgrounds. So four of the inputs we'd use for the cameras and then key them, and four inputs would be used for the live rendered backgrounds that are coming in from the virtual set uh, processing. Now, a lot of virtual sets actually use our deck link cards. We even have a quad HDMI model. So, you know, it, I reckon third party developers could even create um, some really interesting um, uh, virtual set rendering machines. But you could also use macros and the media players to do fixed camera virtual sets. So, let me show you the Kia palettes in the ATEM software control. So, if I go across, um, here, I'll close the SuperSource one. Well, actually, we kind of showed you this before because we used it for DVs, but there they are there. See, so they're four independent uh, Kias. Now, what that means is you can control all these with macros and you can switch the media players into the keys. So what that means is you could create a fixed camera virtual set all in the AT Mini Extreme without any extra hardware. So each camera would have a pre-rendered background. So you could basically um, put that behind the camera so you can key the camera and, uh, over a green screen and then put that background in the back. And if you don't move the camera, you don't really need a live motion virtual set. You can just render out some still frames from a 3D model of a set and put them behind each camera and then use the macros to switch the media players into the keys. So it's an incredibly powerful having four independent chroma keys. I think it's gonna make the whole virtual set thing possible. I mean, it's really, that's a whole new world that we could really pretty much open up. So it's really quite exciting. Now, of course, the big question then, what about bigger work? What happens if you wanna take it even further? What happens if you wanna build a bigger studio? So the ATEM Mini Extreme is really the perfect match for the ATEM one me Advanced panel. In many ways, that became our yardstick of how big this switcher should be. Let's just make it perfect for an ATEM one me Advanced panel. It's a totally professional setup. It unlocks a lot of the power in the switcher. There's dedicated buttons. Um, I've got a few slides here that you can see. It's got dedicated buttons for all the switcher functions. The design is a very traditional broadcast switcher, so it's great for training and education. So using that ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel is a really good way to use the switcher. Um, the ATEM 1ME um, Advanced Panels behind me are connected to the ATEM Mini um, Extreme here. And so we're, you know, we're running the whole panel from there. Now it shows, the great thing is you can see, and I'll bring up some slides here, you can see that all the uh, buttons have input labels, so you can have custom source names. Now there's 10 buttons on these panels, so that supports the eight inputs of the ATEM Mini Extreme and plus the two media players all along that row. And there's a shift button, so you can switch to another 10 sources. You can also see there's a nice big T-bar uh, fader handle. It's got direct access to the downstream keys on the right-hand side there. You can see there's a select bus. Um, which has got all the labels on it. So again, you get if you custom label the uh, inputs, it's not just numbers, they're actually the custom labels. And that um, select bus will switch to macro control. So there's a macro button, and when you switch over, and then all your macros, uh, you can see them by name. So you know, if you're using, uh, if you've done a bunch of custom macros and you've labeled them by name, then you can actually see the actual proper names on the panel because you've got an LCD for the labels. Now it's got a really large system control LCD. It gives you really fast access to all the settings. You get a joystick for moving those DVs around for both the super source and the normal DVEs. So I think the ATEM Mini Extreme is a really perfect size for this panel, and it adds a completely professional workflow when you plug it in. So really, this switcher can go much further if you now fill it out with some of the, the control panels. And you wouldn't even know it's an ATEM Mini uh, model switcher when you're using it, if you didn't know. Uh, also, we have the ATEM camera control panel. It's got dedicated control for all the cameras. That's also perfectly matched for this. It's got four controllers, but you can change the, um, the controllers really quickly. So you can do more than four cameras, and in this case, we'd want to use eight. Um, it's got a really nice big knob on the front, and that's the iris control, which is the default control. It's so nice to use. If you rotate the control, it actually sets the black level. And if you push the control, it actually selects the camera to the video output. And that's something that's used by camera operators when they, you can use one of the, because uh, they're, they're proper aux outputs, you can use one of the outputs to give the camera operator a view of his cameras. So you can be using one of the camera uh, video outputs for multi-view, while your camera operator is actually pushing the knobs and switching that second output so he can see what he's doing and so he gets a chance to match the cameras by really quickly switching between them. There's also RGB knobs for tint and that uses the color corrector in the camera. The pocket cameras, for example, have the color correctors built into them and you can use the tint controls. There's lots of other controls as well. So you can really see how powerful ATEM Mini can stream can be when you realize that once you use it with those panels, really how nice it is. Um, it's a really, it goes all the way to the most professional workflow you can get. So really let's summarize what we have here. Um, you know, we've got uh, eight inputs. Um, each input has standards conversion. You just plug anything in and it works. The audio mixer supports processing on all those inputs. 
which means every HDMI input has a separate limiter, noise gate compressor, and EQ. There's four upstream ATEM advanced chroma keys. They're the good keys, the, the most advanced keys we have in ATEM switches. There's two downstream keys for titles. There's two media players for graphics and titles. There's two independent DVEs for picture-in-picture -picture effects. There's a super source with another four additional DVEs and a multi-layer processor. There's a select bus on the front panel. The multi-view supports up to 16 different views. Uh, both HDMI outputs have source routing, so they work as aux outputs. There's a separate headphone connection with audio monitoring bus, so you've got separate audio monitoring control of that. You know, it's really basically like a 1ME HD version of our Constellation switcher. It's basically the best 1ME switcher we have. It's way more powerful than actually our 1ME SDI models. So it's really exciting, it's an insane um, switcher. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, now the AT Mini Extreme will be available now for 995. I reckon it's gonna be really exciting to see how people uh, use it. Um, yeah, who knows what kind of new workflows are gonna be possible, particularly say things like the virtual sets and things like that, so it's really exciting. Now that's not all we've done. Uh, you know, we have an ISO model of our AT Mini Pro. Um, so we thought it'd be really nice to have an ISO model of the AT Mini Extreme. And we do have that, it's called AT Mini Extreme ISO, and it records all eight inputs and the program video. Now this, this model features a massive record engine. It basically records nine streams in total. It saves the DaVinci uh, Resolve project, so you can record and open up your whole live production as an edit. It means you can fix bad edits, replace shots, and add color correction later. You can even trigger the record in the Blackmagic Pocket cameras, because the Blackmagic, those Pocket cameras support Blackmagic RAW files, so you can link them to the edit. And that's how you can actually do an Ultra HD uh, film workflow in a HD switcher. Um, so it's a great combination. You know, the combination of Blackmagic RAW and color correction makes film looking shows. You know, so obviously we wanted to have an ATEM Mini Extreme that can do that. That's why we felt it was really very important for us to have an ISO model of the ATEM Mini Extreme. It's really quite amazing. Let me bring one out and we can have a look. It's, it's, um, here it is here. You can see it's kind of quite simple. It's, it's very similar. It basically, it's the same. Actually, I'll put it above it so you can see both models compared there. Um, let me line that up. So you can see it's basically the, uh, it looks the same as the ATEM Mini Extreme, except this is ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. So we'll plug it in, we'll transfer the connections across to this guy here. I'll put it on top, because I think that might be the easiest way to transfer the connections. A little bit undignified for the switcher that's below it, but um, let's change the connections across. So input three, input four, input five, there's so many inputs. Input six, input seven, input eight, Video output number two. The conditions on the back are exactly the same. I'll move our USB up. And I'll change our Ethernet. Plug that, and my switch has really gone offline now. And then we'll plug in the ATEM Mini Extreme, and I'll take that ATEM Mini Extreme out of the way. And let's line it up so we can get that overhead camera looking good. There it is there. So you can see it's all lit up and it looks very similar um, to the, uh, set some of my audio there. Um, so you can see it basically it's the same as the ATEM Mini Extreme except it's the ISO model. So it's uh, got similar uh, multi-view, everything's there. It's got some different setups in it because it's you know a different switcher. So now what I'll do is I'll plug in a flash disk, which I've got here. I've got two USB ports, so I can plug it into the second one. So I'll plug it in there. Now, it's, because it's nine streams, you do need a decent flash disk. Some flash disks aren't as fast as they say they are. They'll do bursts at high speed, but they won't sustain it. So make sure you're using a good quality flash disk. Now, what we'll do is we'll go to the record palette because I've got to show you that. Um, so it's in the output menu here. If we can cut across the UI, I'll turn off the live stream. Now, um, you can see it's the same palette as the ATEM Mini Pro models use. So what we need to do is set the ISO recording on. So this is the control here. Um, so if you turn that on, now it's... Uh, will enable the ISO, and you can start recording. Now I can do that on the front panel, which I will do, you can do it from the UI as well. And there it is now, now I'm recording to the disk. I can change between some of the different sources, do some cuts to different sources here. And I can do some transitions, maybe do some dissolves. There's a dissolve. So it's just like a real job. Got a nice fast transition there. Um, now it's worth mentioning that you can use a USB hub and use multiple disks. If you're recording with multiple disks, it'll move from disk to disk as each disk fills up. So you can record forever if you keep adding empty disks. You can also use a Blackmagic Multidock as it's four SSD disks on a single USB port. 
Um, so that's really nice. Now, while it's recording, let's plug, I've got the USB actually, I'm controlling the computer by the USB. I'm not actually using it via the network, I'm using the USB connection. So I have webcam coming into the computer. So let's launch an app. I've got a, I'll just use QuickTime Player. I had that open a second ago, so there it is there. And if I go to the file menu and use a video recording, I can show the webcam source, there it is there. So what I've got going on now is I've got a recording going on while I've got webcam source. And also, let's start streaming to YouTube. So if I turn on streaming, now I'll run the streaming. And so now I'm actually live streaming to YouTube and it's now really heavily loaded up. I'm doing nine streams of recording because I'm doing an ISO recording. I've got USB webcam going on the screen here and I've also got live streaming to YouTube all at the same time. So now if I do some more transitions, I just keep doing that. And it's pretty nice. Now, what I can do is I can now stop recording and we can go and have a look and see what it looks like on the computer. So I'll stop recording and I'll stop streaming as well and I'll close this. Now I'll take my disk and I'll plug it into the computer so we can have a look what it looks like on the computer. So I've got two USB ports on the side of the computer. So I'll minimize my uh, software controller. So if you can switch across to the ATEM, I don't want to use that as a backup. So there it is there. So here's my uh, disk that I've just recorded on the ATEM Mini Pro ISO. So I can open up the disk and see what's in there. You can see I've got a whole folder with all the files that have been recorded when I was doing my recording. Let's have a look inside. So you can see I've got my uh, folder with my ISO files. You can see the eight inputs there. Um, I'll go back and I've got the audio source files. I've also got a program recording here. And this is the DaVinci Resolve ISO file. So this is the pro uh, program file. So basically it's the, it's the edit. So if I double click that, I've got DaVinci running in the background and it'll now open up that folder and there's my edit. So this is what I just did on the switcher. So you can, if you look at the timeline, this is the cut page. I did a whole bunch of uh, cuts and some transitions over here. And then I was talking for a while and I did love talking and I was talking for a while and then I did a few more transitions towards the end here. And you can see now that I can, you know, I can move edits around and, and really re-trim and do all kinds of different, uh, different edits. And if I go in here, I can see I've got my ISO files in here. And there's all my different camera views. So there's, yeah, the, um, that's just the recording from that one camera. So it's all really nice. Um, you can do all kinds of editing. So, you know, what's also great is the Blackmagic RAW files I record, if you can record them in the camera, you can change those over uh, and, and link to those if you wanted to. Now, uh, I can also do uh, use the sync bin so I can see all the camera views. So if I go up to the sync bin up here, what I've now got is, go back to my master. Now I've got all the camera views back in a multi-view because they're all synchronized, they've all got the same time code now I can run up and down and now re-edit, and especially if you're using the speed editor, this is really fast. And I can now you know, re-edit or change and drop, you know, um, I can use the uh, source override edit mode, which is this one here, and it'll actually edit you know, various shots into the timeline and sync up all the time code and everything for you. So it's really fast to create new edits. And if, you know, if you're using Blackmagic RAW files from the cameras, which you can also select uh, to switch over to the link to, you can finish in Ultra HD. You, know, and you can also do color correction because they're all film gamma. Um, so I'll switch back to the normal media pool. And uh, so, you know, I think it's amazing uh, if you think you can record, this switch will record nine video streams all at the same time. It's an incredibly powerful model. It's very exciting. So the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO is just starting production now. Um, so it'll probably be, you know, appearing in about a week or so. It's will be priced at 1295. And I can't wait to see people how people sort of use it. I think it's gonna be really exciting. Okay, so next I wanted to talk about how to add streaming to our SDI range of switches. You know, our Blackmagic Web Presenter has been a real popular streaming solution, but it was quite limited. It was US, basically USB webcam only, and it was uh, the webcam was only 720p. Uh, so we wanted to totally redesign this model, but we also wanted to reposition what it was used for. So it was more than just a simple redesign. We wanted the new model to be more focused on sort of high-end workflows and to work with our most powerful switches that we have. You know, the ATEM Mini in many ways can now handle the HDMI workflows. Uh, so we really wanted a newer model that was really designed for an SDI workflow only. Uh, we also needed a solution for ATEM Television Studio and our ATEM Constellation switches. So we've designed a whole new model and it's dramatically more powerful. Let me, uh, I'll go across here and we've got a bit of space and I can show you, I'll bring the unit out. So here it is, here it is here. Um, you can see the uh, similar size, it's the same size as the old design, but it's a whole new design. Uh, basically our thoughts were it's a bit like a television transmitter for the streaming age. Uh, it's kind of the philosophy we used when we designed it. It's way more advanced than the previous model and has a lot more features. Uh, it removes a few of the features we don't need, like the HDMI input, because you know we don't need that now. 
uh, but it's it's been designed specifically for high-end broadcast and live event work. Uh, so it's a much more sort of higher end. So we've repositioned it, you know, and changed the underlying philosophy about what it's really now for. Now it's only a third rack width, so it uses our Turnix Mini rack shelves if you want to rack mount it. Um, uh, let's have a look at the back. Um, I'll turn it around, you can see the, the rear side, I think you get a close up of that. So quite different to the old model. Now it's got a 12 GSDI input and it's got a Terranix down converter on the input. So you can take any HD or ultra HD input and stream to it. Um, it doesn't matter what the input video is, it just works. You'll see that there's also a um, loop, there's two, um, sorry, one loop 12G SDI output. So you can loop out to other equipment. And what that lets you do is you can build like an array of web presenters for multiple platforms or even redundancy. For example, you could use the one web presenter for the YouTube primary stream and a separate web presenter for the YouTube secondary stream and you can loop the SDI input across to all those different web presenters for the different platforms. It gives you a lot of redundancy. Now there's also a HDMI and a 3G SDI monitoring output um, which I'll talk about in a minute. The reason we put a HDMI output on there for the monitoring is because you can just plug a computer monitor straight in. So even though the newer model is designed for SDI workflows, having that HDMI in there means you don't need to use a separate converter just to monitor the, the output. Now it still works with USB webcam. You see there's a USB on the back there. And, but it, now it's 1080p um, webcam. So it's much better than the previous model which was only 720p with the webcam. You can also see the Ethernet connections there. So it's got the live streaming now built in. It's got a professional H64 codec built in. So it'll now live stream direct to the platforms, to the online platforms. You don't need any computer software now. It's all self-contained in this one small unit. Um, and then you can use both the USB webcam and the live streaming at the same time. They both work at the same time. You can also see we've got two power options on the rear panel there as well. There's the AC for regular power. Um, plus there's now a broadcast four pin 12 volt DC power um, for backup power. And you could use that with a separate power supply. And so you'd have two AC sources, one direct and one using the power supply. Or that could be a battery so you could stay on air in a power failure. Um, so it's really exciting. Now let's turn it around. We'll have a look at the front again and we'll plug it in and get, some, uh, get it up and running. We need to plug in um, a whole bunch of connections. So I'll plug in some power. I've got uh, everything here. I've been plugging a lot of connections in today. So I've got some power. I've got my Ethernet, which I'll plug in. I've also got, I'll use the HDMI monitoring out, which I'll plug in. And I'll plug my SDI source. When that SDI source is coming from the AT Mini here, so we've just converted the program out so I can get a nice source there and plug it all in. So you should be able to see that on the front panel. Now it's all up and running. Um, now the old models, the front panel was actually optional. Now it's included as standard. So you get that front panel as standard. You know, because it live streams internally, you need, really need the front panel for control. You know, it's got that dedicated on air button. So you really need to see, you really need to have access to that. And there's also menus as well. So let's see how that, uh, works. So we've got a computer up on the rear screen if we can switch across to that. And that's got YouTube and a web browser so we can bring uh, the unit on air. Um, and that's all there is to it. Now you can also do this from the utility. I've got a Mac over here which I've got plugged into the network. This is plugged into the network as well. I can run the utility and show you. So if you can just pan across here and get a cut of the computer over here. Um, here's the ATEM, sorry here's the Blackmagic Web Presenter utility. So I can go in there and you can see I've got the settings in here. Um, it's similar settings to the ATEM Mini, so it's very familiar. So that looks like the um, streaming tab in the ATEM Mini, so it's a quite a familiar uh, user interface. I've already entered the um, streaming settings in here, so it's faster to show you, so I didn't really have to do any of that. Um, and so that's nice. So if we go back to the unit, you can see the front panel also has uh, all the buttons for the LCD menus, and you can change settings from the front panel as well. So you can, uh, can turn on the menu button over here. You can see I've got some menus. Um, and the LCD also includes uh, video monitoring and audio meters. There's a really nice big, if you look at the status of that LCD and you can get a bit of a close-up of that, you see a really big on-air indicator. I wanted an on-air indicator that's big enough that when you're looking across the room at a rack, you can actually see which web presenters are on-air. So that's why we needed that a bit larger. The input video standard's also on there as well. And there's also a time counter showing how long the stream's been running. And it even includes a day count. So it's actually day, uh, hours, minutes, and seconds. The network status is there as well. Now it also supports the phone tethering like the A2 Mini that I showed you before. If the Ethernet goes down, you can switch over. So you can plug in the phone, a mobile phone into the USB. The LCD will show what network is connections active because there's actually a network indicator there, whether it's Ethernet or mobile data. So I don't need to show you how the tethering works because it's the same as the A2 Mini Pro I just showed you. Now there's also, you will notice on the front, there's a USB-C connection on the front panel. That also works as a webcam. 
So what's really interesting about that is you can basically walk up to the front of the unit and plug straight into it and monitor video with any software that works with a webcam. I was just using QuickTime Player before. Now that's great for diagnostics. Um, and the utility also works through USB or Ethernet. So you can walk right up to the front of a rack and plug into the unit and get both live video and change the settings all in that one USB connection. Plus you can plug a phone into the front panel as well. So that USB also supports a phone. So you can plug the phone tethering in. So if you had an internet problem when you're running, you could actually go and plug your phone into the front panel. So that USB on the front is really flexible. So one of the, so of course, you know, what other things can you do? Well, one of the interesting uses you can use is with editing. Now on the Mac over here that I was showing with DaVinci, I've got an Ultra Studio Mini monitor connected to the Mac. It converts the timeline out to live video for monitoring, which is how you generally would use that when you're video editing, you want to see your user interface, but it's nice to have another video monitor showing the actual live video. Now if I plug that into the WebPresenter HD, I can actually use it to stream to remote clients. So let's connect the Ultra Studio Mini monitor into the WebPresenter HD. Now I've got that connection here, so I'll unplug the uh, ATEM Mini source and I'll plug in my ATEM Mini monitor and that'll switch over. Now what we can do is go across to the timeline. So if we cut back to the timeline here, I've got the utility running, so I'll quit that. And now I'll come back here to the timeline. And you can see now I've got the uh, video from the editing timeline playing out to, I'll loop that and play it. But this is my editing timeline now uh, running out. And you can uh, basically send the stream to clients and they can watch the edit. You just need to set the YouTube stream to low latency and it works really well. So you can see the web presenter is actually really flexible. You can use it for all kinds of tasks. I mean, who knows what else it could be used for? It's really quite, uh, quite nice. So remember the two monitoring outputs we talked about before. Let's connect those up and we can see how those work. So if you come back to the uh, web presenter here. Um, now I've plugged in the monitoring. If we can switch it up onto the screen here, um, and we can see uh, what's going on. In fact, I'll plug the uh, switcher back in. I'll unplug the timeline and plug back into the switcher so I can do some cutting. Um, so you can see there it is. Now you can see if I cut to that directly, I've got to feed into the switcher. Um, this is a high-end broadcast streaming transmitter, so we really wanted to do something serious with the monitoring. So it includes a lot more information than you'd sort of expect on a simple monitoring out. Basically, it's got everything I needed when I worked in post-production. You know, I was putting in digital systems back in the 90s, and I needed you know a lot of outboard gear that had different sort of information that I needed to make sure the whole system worked. I've taken pretty much all of that and just put it in this one tech monitoring output. So let me explain what's really going on on this video output. Uh, so if you can cut to that, um, you'll see um, that output directly. So obviously we've got a very large video display. Um, it's got uh, audio meters, and those audio meters, you can select the type of audio meter. The VU meter is, is what we're using here. It's got the correct ballistics. Now there's a title at the top left-hand side, and you can change that. So for example, if you had multiple web presenters doing different streams, you could have like YouTube primary, YouTube secondary, you could name them, and that title at the top left will change. And it really helps you keep track of which representers what if you're switching to monitoring. Like you could use, because there's an SDI monitoring out, you could actually run it into a router and have one on a monitor switching across all the different statuses of all different web presenters. You got a nice big on-air indicator. You got a time counter for streaming, which is like the front panel. There's a bunch of streaming details as well. The platform, the streaming standard, the quality and the streaming key. Obviously we're only showing part of the streaming key, you don't want the whole key, otherwise people will just hack your stream, so we don't want to do that. Now we have a nice little area for video status, and that's all the video input information. So there's a film strip, so you can see the last six seconds of, um, of, of the inputs. So you can see a recent history of what's been going on as the video source. There's also lots of technical data. There's the input video standard, there's color entry, time code, CRC check, Luma and Chroma bit activity. Now that's an interesting display. Basically what you get is an X is uh, displayed when the bit's changing between high and low, or it's an L when it's low, or it's a H when it's a high bit. And what that's really good for is seeing if you've got 10 or 8-bit video. Now if it was 8-bit video, the bottom two bits on the right-hand side there will be L's because they don't have any data in them. So it's a really good quality check. And it also can tell you if you have a stuck bit in some of the upstream processing. So you can really see what kind of things are going on. Uh, if, for example, if you saw some banding or something strange happening on the stream, you can have a quick look at the bit activity, see what the quality of the video level is, if it's 10-bit, or if you've got a weird stuck bit or some kind of other fault. There are broadcast engineers who actually know about the SDI standard might notice that all the bits are low when there's black video. Um, that's because we've subtracted the SDI offsets to make the bit activity a bit easier to understand. So we've just that's what we've done there. Because uh, it's more a more user-based feature than it is a sort of a technical-based feature for the video standard. Now, uh, the audio input area is actually quite similar to the video area. You see there's an audio waveform that shows the last second seconds of the audio. So it's again, it's a recent history of what's been going on on the, on the sound. Um, there's also details of the audio channel status word 
and these details are encoded. These are the details basically they're encoded with the audio data. Now we decode those bits and display the results. So you can see some of the information there like sample frequency, emphasis, word length, origin, time of day, sample address. There's the aux bit status. Now not all products um, that do audio you know, use this information, but generally, you know, generally audio works without it. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of information there. There's, it's almost like additional sort of information. Uh, some stuff's used like emphasis, but not all of it. The CRC is checked and displayed. There's also a bit activity indicator like the video, but this one's showing the entire um, AES kind of uh, audio word. And it's a really nice way of seeing the audio bit depth. Like you can check to see if you've got 16, 20 or 24 bit of audio. The four um, flag bits are also shown and they're labeled with the, the V, U, C and P above those there, the actual flag bits. Now this is, um, there's also an embedded audio status indicator. Now these show you which channels in the SDI connection actually have data embedded into them. Now a lot of equipment can actually embed more channels than they really use. Like for example our Hyperdeck, if you know, it, it embeds 16 channels, even if you've got it set to stereo, so there's only actually audio on two of the channels. But this is a great way to see what audio channels are present in the SDI connection. And if there's a channel present, it'll be displayed as a P. So you can see that there. Um, now you also notice at the bottom there's actually two graphs. Now this is the same data rate and case indicators that are on the ATEM Mini, or the ATEM Mini Pro I should say, or the ATEM Mini Extreme now. Uh, but there's actually a graph of the last 60 seconds of, of the history of what's been going on. So the data rate for the last 60 seconds is really nice because it shows you kind of the recent history of the data rate needed to encode this video. Now the data rate is really dependent on the quality and the frame rate and also the input video. Um, so there's a lot of things that can actually affect how much data you, you're encoding to. So what you're seeing here is what the codec is actually generating. This is the data rate the codec's generating. So it's also showing you what data rate you need from the network to get a good quality stream. So that's a really nice indicator and it's always on even if you're not uh, uh, live you know, on air it still shows that. There's also the cache status for the last 60 seconds as well. And this shows you a lot about the quality of the internet connection, of the network connection. So you know, if you're having problems with the network connection you can see that going up because the cache is struggling to, to try and get, you know, get the data out of the unit. So it's really exciting. So the technical monitoring output has really got a lot of useful information in it. Now the Blackmagic Worm Presenter HD is going to be available now and it'll be $4.95. And it includes the front panel with the LCD menus now. It's got the live stream built into it to go to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and more. It also supports webcam via USB. It includes this broadcast technical monitoring and it supports uh, full remote control via the software utility on Mac and Windows. You know, it's only a third rack width so you can get like three streaming channels in a single rack width um, if you put three of them. But it really fits perfectly next to the ATEM TV Studio HD. It, read, you know, it adds streaming to all our SDI based uh, switcher models. So we think it's going to be a really exciting product. So now I want to talk about Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Now it's been received really well and so like the 4K model it's a true digital film camera. It's got a nice low light sensor in 6K, it's EF lens mount so it works with lots of lenses. You know the large sensor is just perfect with EF lenses. There's so many Canon lenses around that have EF uh, lens mounts so it's very uh, very common to find great lenses with it. it records to internal uh, cards as well as external USB uh, discs. It's got 3D lookup tables. It includes Blackmagic RAW and Generation 4 color science. It's got a wonderful film gamma, supports ProRes recording. Uh, it's got Blackmagic OS. It's got a really big screen for a handheld camera. A lot of handheld cameras have tiny screens, but this is a big screen. It makes it really easy to focus. And there's tons of focus assist features. You know, false color, histogram, zebra, frame guides, focus peaking, you know, just lots of stuff. Plus the HDMI monitoring output includes overlays for film sets. You can set up like on-set monitoring. But it also includes the studio camera features that we, you know, been using with ATEM Mini here. Um, so it's really a production camera and a studio camera in the one design. Very easy to use, very high quality, and it's getting used on some really high-end work, and kind of like what we hoped it would. So what does that mean? Um, well, you know, it's doing high-end digital film really well, and it's being rigged and used on high-end film projects. So we really started thinking about that and started thinking about a model that might have more features. So we were thinking, could we put some of the features from the Ursa Mini Pro into the pocket camera design? And we've managed to do that. And so today we have a new model. It's a third camera in the range. And so I'll come across and I'll show you. The new model is called Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro. But it's actually a whole new design. It's slightly bigger and it has because it's got a lot of new features included. So I'll bring one out and you can have a look and you can, you can see for yourself. So here it is here. So you can see I'll put it beside the other cameras. So you can see um, from a design point of view, it's very similar. Um, it has similar controls. So it's very familiar to use, but you know, because it's a member of the Pocket Cinema Camera family and you can see how it fits in there. Um, so I can show you the front, you can see it's really similar. If you can get a close up of that and you can see how that looks. Um, it's also very similar on the rear side. 
Uh, it has the uh, same, I'll turn it around there. It's got the same amazing 6K sensor. Uh, however, we've actually upgraded it to generation five color science from the 12K camera. So it produces some amazing cinematic images. So I think the first thing you can really notice there is it's got a, it's got a new uh, LCD screen. It's a high brightness HDR screen. It also tilts up and down. So if I turn the camera on, I'll get the screen up. Um, and you can see really how bright that screen is. Um, and so it's great for outdoor shooting. And I can tilt it up and I can tilt it down. So you see there it is there, and it tilts. So you've got a lot of control there. So if I tilt it down, you can shoot high up and you can hold it up high and shoot high up. And if I'm tilted down, I can shoot really low and get a nice sort of low view, you know. Also tilting is great for the menus. It helps to give you better access to the menus there. Um, so you can see, and you can change the menus. So it's quite nice. So we've also, the other thing we've done is we've upgraded the battery and now it's using an NPF uh, 570 Sony style battery. Now it supports a lot longer battery life, um, which I think is important when you're recording the external discs. You know, when you're running external discs, the camera powers the disc. So having more power really helps. So let me show you the battery in the bottom here. So it's the same type of battery door. There it is there, so it's a larger battery. There it is there, it'll power back up. So now what's the other exciting feature of this is the, um, turn it back off, back on again, turn itself off. So what's also really nice is this new model has built-in ND filters. Now they're actually motor driven, so they are a little different to the uh, Ursa Mini Pro ND filters. And if you look at the back here, we've got ND motor, uh, the filter controls here. So let me re remove the lens. You can actually see them working if I take the lens off. Um, so I'll do that. I always get nervous taking lenses off. So if you get a close up there, you can see into the front of the camera, is that, maybe I'll point to the camera there and you can see it. Um, so now I can change the filters and you can see them move. You got that? And you can see them change. So there's two filters and they're changing in and they both work together. And there's also an indication on the rear. So let me put the lens back on. Oops, there I am. So if I go around the back here, you can see the ND filters changing. Again, if you can get a shot of that. There's the ND filters there. And you can see there's actually also a, a status on the LCD to show you what um, filters are applied. So I think it's much more um, flexible. I'll turn the filters off. It's fun, I could actually just sit here doing this all day. Um, so it's great, have, of course, having the ND filters built in because it's a much more portable solution. This is a portable camera, um, but it gives you total control of the shutter angle when you're in bright conditions because you can just pull those ND filters in, cut down the light. Now there's also support for an electronic, um, an optional electronic viewfinder. So there's a separate viewfinder that you can purchase and add to the camera if you need it. It's called the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera Pro EVF and it bolts right on top of the camera, right there. So let's have a look. I'll show you the EVF. I'll bring it out. You can see it's super tiny there. Um, so you can see there it is there. I can get a shot of that. There it is there. And you can see the underside. That's where it plugs into the camera. And you can see the lens there. And so I've got a really nice glass lens. You know, it's a professional viewfinder with a glass lens. You know, most viewfinders are just plastic and you know, especially for portable cameras and they scratch easy. They don't look really clear. This is a glass lens, it's very accurate. The focus, it's really clean and very clear. In fact, underneath, there's a focus adjustment on the bottom there, so you can adjust it. Now, because it's a professional uh, viewfinder, we've actually also got uh, eyepieces that are included with it. I'll bring them out. There's four eyepieces in total. So you've actually got some options. Um, so you've got a, an eyepiece that's actually installed on it. Then there's a slightly larger version of that. Then there's also a very large one that's left and right eyed. So you've got a few different options there. So I'll line them up there. And they come with it. So you don't have to buy them separately. Now the viewfinder is really easy to install. You just unscrew the cover on the top of the camera and then you can install it on top. So let me show you that. I'll unscrew the, uh, the cover on the camera. I'll just screw it over here. We'll take that off. 
Um, there's the cover there, I'll just show you quickly. It's just a plastic cover, just covers over the hole. And now you'll see there's a space on the top of the camera. If you can get a shot of that, you can see where the viewfinder plugs in. So all I need to do is plug the viewfinder in. Probably should turn the camera off when I do this. And I'll tilt it up. There it is. I can tighten it down. Just finger tighten it. And there it is, it's installed on the camera. Finish shot there. Now it tilts up and down like I was just doing to install it. So you can see you've got a huge range. So you can imagine with a nice big eyepiece on there, you know, how nice that looks. Now the focus adjustment is under there. And if I turn the camera around, you can see, I have to get a shot of that with the focus adjustment. You can see the lens move when I adjust the focus. Can you see that? So there it is there. So that's under there. Now there's a focus pattern built in to the camera um, to allow you to get really accurate focus. So you just go into the monitor menu and you can access the focus chart from there. It's a really bright OLED display. So the sensor will, uh, it's got a sensor on the back so it turns the OLED on and off when you're not using it. And the main LCD will also turn off when you're using the viewfinder to save power. And you can see you can change the viewfinders, uh, the eyepieces out. I'm actually left eyed, so I like the left eye eyepiece. And um, so it's a real professional solution. Now, if we look at the side of the camera, you can see we still have the um, SD card slots on the side. So we've got them there, so you can open up the card slots. So you've got the same media that the other card, uh, that the other models use. And we also have on the side connections here. So you can get a bit of a close up of that. We've also got the similar, very similar connections on the side. We still have the HDMI output for monitoring. We've got the USB for recording to external flash disk. We've got the headphone connector. We've also got the, mic, uh, the video type mic input connector but we now have an extra XLR connector. So you can plug in two separate microphones and they're both phantom powered or you can of course plug in from professional audio gear. You can actually plug stereo XLR sources now. Um, and then, you know, as far as phantom power goes, the new battery's got lots of power for the battery. Now, the other thing we've got um, is we have a new battery grip. You know, if you're doing very long shoots, you really want it to, you know, it's nice to have a battery grip. It's called the Blackmagic Pocket Camera Pro Grip. Sorry, the Blackmagic Pocket Camera Battery Pro Grip. I always get that wrong for some reason. I've got some neural damage that's causing issues with the name. Now it holds two extra batteries, but it's a little different. Um, it supports the same large batteries that the camera uses, so those newer type batteries, and it bolts onto the bottom of the camera. So here it is there, you can see, and it's a bit different. Um, it doesn't displace the internal battery. So there it is there. So what you can do is, um, is install it on the bottom of the camera and it won't displace. You're adding two extra batteries and you keep the battery in the camera. So I think this is a better design. Now, if you see the uh, top of it, how it does that, it's got these power pins there and that's how that talks to the camera. So there's a spot on the, on the battery tray also to support. There's a cover on the bottom of the camera there, which I'll unscrew. And what that gives you is access to the power pins on the bottom of the camera and if you see if you can get a close up of that. Now there's actually a spot on the battery tray to store that little cover I just took off so you don't lose it. Uh, and then if you take the battery grip off you can then reinstall that on the bottom. So let's put the uh, battery grip on and um, you can have a look. So basically you could just mount it down like that and spin the uh, screw and there it is. It's all on the camera. Turn the camera back on. So now I'm running three batteries in the camera. So it's, it's a monster when you've got that installed. Look at that. Um, and the battery tray slides out, so you can slide the batteries out and you can change them. And the battery, the camera still runs, it won't turn off. So, and you can just uninstall it by uh, just running the screw thread back out again. And then you can take it off. So you can really just add it and take it off as you go. You know, it's, it's really nice. And so that's the battery grip. So the new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro we priced at $2495 and it's in stock and it's available now. The, back, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera Pro EVF will be priced at $495 and that's also available now and it's in stock. And the Blackmagic Pocket Camera Battery Pro Grip is priced at $145 and that's also available now. Now the battery grip is sold without the batteries because these you know, NP uh, F570 batteries, you can get them anywhere um, so you can you know, source those yourself. So we think the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera um, 6K Pro is a really great addition to the family. You can see we have three great cameras depending on the kind of work you're doing. 
They're all professional digital film cameras. They can be used for all kinds of work, and you know, they're very, very portable. Um, so they're amazing. So one last thing we have just before we go, we also have a software update that's due. It's not quite ready yet, but it's coming soon. So what we're doing is one of the things I didn't show you on the back is we have new software for the 4K and the 6K pocket cinema cameras. Now all the cameras get a new RGB histogram. Um, so the, the current luminance but only histogram doesn't always show you clipped images. You know, if you clip in a single color, sometimes you can't tell because it's not clipping in the luminance. So the new RGB histogram fixes that. Um, and so that's really nice. So if I turn on the, the 4K camera here, you can see, we we'll get a bit of a close up. You can see that's the RGB histogram there. And I've probably not got a lot of really good things to point it at that's gonna show you that working properly, but you can see it there. I'll just hop, stop moving the camera around so you can kind of see it. Let me get a good view of that there. So that RGB histogram is much nicer. And there it is on the 4K model and all the models will get that new um, histogram when the software update goes out. So I'll place it back in in line there. So, uh, so that's really nice. Plus the other great thing is we're upgrading all the color science and all the models. So both the 4K and the 6K models will get the new generation five color science. So all the models will have the latest color science from actually the 12K camera research that we've been doing. So it's really exciting. Now that software update will be free. It supports the uh, Blackmagic Pocket Camera 4K, the 6K, and it'll upgrade the new 6K Pro as well. It's called Camera Update 7.3 and it'll be available in about a month or so. So we're still doing a lot of debugging. Obviously with COVID, it's a bit tough to get things through QA because everyone's everywhere. Every five minutes there's some other breakout. So we're working as hard as we can to get that out the door and that'll be a free update. So that's about all we have for today. Um, so I think we've got some really nice switches with the new, a new A10 Mini Extremes. You know, they're very powerful. We have an amazing professional cinema camera with a new Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera uh, 6K Pro. You know, it's so small when you consider how much we've actually built into it. It's incredible. Um, we have an amazing streaming solution with this new Blackmagic Web Presenter HD. You know, it's the broadcast uh, transmitter for the streaming world. So I think it's really nice. And, and you know, I've got, to, I've got to thank all the engineers who've worked so hard on these new products at Blackmagic. There's engineers all over the world and everyone's come together and worked really hard. You know, it's tough with COVID because, but everyone's done an amazing job. And again, thanks for all you guys, for all your feedback. It's always great working together. It's an exciting industry and we just love being part of it. Um, I just, you know, I'm getting older and it's been, been doing it for a long time. So it's great to just keep bringing out more and more new products. It's really exciting. Um, you know, when we work together, there's no limit on what we can do and there's no limit to what's possible. So again, please remain safe and I uh, hope it won't be too much longer. We'll be back at trade shows talking again. I love talking as these videos get rather long. So take care and uh, we'll talk soon and, and take care, bye.